Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. In this episode, we're going to do a quick overview of Vatican I, and then proceed to the three categories or levels of magisterial statements. Afterwards, we will turn our attention to common objections Eastern Orthodox apologists give online against papal infallibility and show why they are not warranted. Lastly, we will provide what I hope to be a helpful example which illustrates the three levels of magisterial teaching. Let's begin. Before we break down the three kinds of magisterial statements and the three levels of assent as formulated by the CDF, it's only right to first give a brief overview of the circumstances surrounding Vatican I from which these sprouted. The First Vatican Council was convened in December of 1869 as a direct response to the sea of confusion that began to flood the world. With the rise of anti-clericalism, socialism, liberalism, pantheism, and the aftershock of the Enlightenment and Reformation, the Church needed to respond aggressively so as to affirm faith in the midst of utter confusion. One could say that the goal of the Council was to shake off the hangover of faulty reasoning and sober up the people of God on the pure dogmas of the faith. For a new breed of evil, not unlike the Yurok Highs in Lord of the Rings, began to be birthed at an exponential rate, bringing with them the confusion of rationalism and a darkness which clouded the light of faith and buried it beneath the shadows of secular dialogue. If the church was to be a beacon of light in the midst of darkness, it needed to assert itself with vigor and compelled by charity, stretch out for the lost children by a banner which whistles for all around the world. The Holy Church, longing with maternal care, stretched out her wings by convening a Council of Vatican to fight heel to heel against the secular world. The children had grown away from her arms as they progressed into the stage of adolescence, and newfound knowledge which rendered her unnecessary. Here, the Church would understand by a profoundly wounding experience the Apostles' words, children will rise up in a disobedience to their parents. If I was to sum up Vatican I in a couple of sentences, I would simply say that this council, with a motherly overtone, would introduce the authority of the Father as a last fortification against the wiles of the devil. If hell was breathing heavy at this moment, then here, above all moments, was it opportune to assert the promise of Christ to Peter, namely, you are Kepha, and upon this Kepha I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In this council, above all, the Father of Lights would unfold to the fatherless a ray of sunshine which distinguishes reason from faith and what is malleable from what is solid. Having considered with broad strokes what circumstances motivated the First Vatican Council, let us now go on to consider the three categories of magisterial statements. The first of the three categories of magisterial teaching is what is called by many divinely revealed truth. You may also hear it referred to as infallible dogma or definitive dogma. These truths have their root in sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which both flow from the single wellspring of divine revelation. That is, God himself has revealed something to his people, which they would by no means know with certainty unless he unveiled it. Now since this category has, as an object, truth which is above human reason, God must supply a superadded illumination of the intellect in order to proportion it for adherence and belief. This superadded virtue is called the gift of faith, which does not destroy reason, but elevates it into a higher perfection. Thus, the object of faith is truth that is above reason, since what is being proposed is from God himself. For this reason, the Church calls all of the faithful to assent with divine Catholic faith. Thus far we have discussed the object of faith namely, God himself as revealed in sacred scripture and tradition. 
and we have discussed the propositions which flow from his revelation, namely, the articles of faith. But it remains to be asked, what is the epistemic mechanism provided by God so as to reveal and pronounce a supernatural truth which is to be assented to by all the faithful? The first epistemic mechanism which we have already discussed is the gift of faith. This gift is the intrinsic principle whereby one sees and believes what is above reason. But this gift, in and of itself, is not sufficient to perfectly know apart from a guiding principle extrinsic to it. The intrinsic principle which Christ established for the faithful is what we in the Catholic Church call the sacred magisterium. The word magisterium comes from the Latin word magister, which means master or teacher. This teaching authority which was divinely instituted by Christ is hierarchically ordered among the successors of the apostles with Saint Peter and his successors in Rome occupying the topmost peak and, by God's grace, even piercing into heaven itself. From this hierarchy the revealed truths about the faith redound to and are dispersed among the faithful as a solid bedrock on which to throw itself upon. What I have spoken to you, namely the apostles, in the light, speak in the dark, says our Lord. In the hierarchy of the church, God makes known with the greatest certitude the necessary truth so as to illuminate the path before his bride and expel her darkness. Now, within the magisterium, or teaching authority of the church, there is a threefold distinction of magisterial teaching which descends down to the faithful through the liturgy, creeds, and praxis of the church. The first of the three is what we are discussing in this section of the video called Divinely Revealed Truth. Now this category, unlike the other two, which we have not yet discussed, has at its root a definitive definition, or solemn judgment, which is proposed by the church as divinely revealed and thus demands the assent of divine faith. Now this definitive definition, which flows down to the faithful from the magisterium, has as an impetus the infallible charism which resides in the successor of St. Peter, and by extension, the bishops gathered together in union with him. Thus, when it comes to the charism of infallibility, the bishop of Rome alone, as Peter's successor, can issue a formal definition concerning faith or morals to be assented to by the faithful. This is in virtue of the immediate and singular authority given to Peter by Christ in Matthew 16. The exercise of this authority is called by Vatican I ex cathedra papal teachings. About this teaching, Vatican I states as follows, quote, we teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the Roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra, that is, when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church, he possesses, by the divine assistance promised to him in Blessed Peter, that infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman Pontiff are of themselves and not by the consent of the church irreformable. So then, should anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity to reject this definition of ours, let him be anathema." Close quote. Now the second inner circle of infallibility, which is couched within papal infallibility, is what is called by the theologians the extraordinary conciliar magisterium. This is applicable when the bishops are collectively gathered together with the Pope, such as an ecumenical council, all bishops participate together with him in the charism of infallibility. This is in virtue of Matthew 18 where the apostles agree where, 
two or more are gathered together in Christ's name. In short, the Bishop of Rome possesses in an immediate and singular way what the other apostles possess in a collective and diffused way. Thus, the Pope can issue a definitive definition immediately, while the other bishops only issued definitive definitions immediately in union with him or by his approval. Now, when a divine truth has been revealed by God and identified by the extraordinary magisterium as an article of faith to be believed by all, then the faithful are bound to assent to that proposition by the gift of faith. If a member of the faithful chooses to suspend assent with obstinacy, then that member has departed from the church and fallen into the sin of heresy. This is most evidently seen in Galatia, where the Galatians withheld assent to the Council of Jerusalem, ruling on circumcision, and preferred to defer to others in the magisterium as an extrinsic principle of epistemology. For this reason, Paul declares the Galatians to have fallen from grace. Thus far, we have discussed the first of three levels of magisterial teaching in the proper ascent of the faithful. We also discuss faith as an intrinsic principle that works in conjunction with the extrinsic principle of the sacred magisterium through which divine propositions are revealed. If anyone chooses to obstinately reject an article of faith which belongs to the first level of magisterial teaching, they become ipso facto a heretic. Let us now go on to consider the second level or category of magisterial teaching that descends to the faithful and what kind of assent is required. The second level or category of magisterial teaching is called by the theologians the ordinary and universal magisterium. This level of teaching like the first level has a dogma as an object and for this reason it requires the assent of faith. Unlike the first category, however, these magisterial teachings are not solemnly defined and yet are universally attested to diachronically. Examples of this can be seen in the Church's universal rejection of women as priests and in the universal acceptance of prayer to the saints. These dogmatic facts are so bound up with the definitive dogmas that they are inseparable. An analogy that might help the listener grasp this level of teaching can be seen when considering human beings as a whole. Though a human being is, by definition, a rational animal, nevertheless there are parts of the human being that is necessarily bound up with the definition and yet not disclosed in the definition. An example of this is risability, or more commonly called, the ability to laugh. Thus, risability is to man what the dogmas that are undefined are to the dogmas that are solemnly defined. Now, even as it is not permitted by reason in the natural domain to deny that all men laugh, even so it is not permitted by faith in the supernatural domain to deny that all clerical priests in the church are men. At no point has the church solemnly defined that only men are priests, but it is so bound up to the defined dogmas and praxis of the church that to reject it is to destroy the foundation Christ laid altogether. Other examples that fall under this category are canonization of the saints, the Catholic moral stance on abortion and euthanasia, and declaration of an ecumenical council, to name a few. Thus far, we have discussed the second level of magisterial teaching as concrete and perennially present by the movement of the Holy Spirit. Though these dogmas are not solemnly defined, nevertheless they are so bound up with the solemnly defined dogmas that one cannot separate them. For this reason, the Church demands the firm assent of faith for this category that flows down to the faithful concomitantly with the first. Let us now go on to consider the third and lowest level of magisterial teaching. 
The lowest level of magisterial teaching which descends to the faithful is called the Ordinary Fallible Magisterium, or the Authentic Ordinary Magisterium. In some places it's also referred to as the Ordinary Teachings on Faith and Morals. Some argue for a fourth level beneath this, where they place homilies and prudential teachings through which error is more apt to appear. But I prefer to just keep it to the three for this video. Now this third level is unique from the other two in that it does not exercise infallible teaching as an object, and thus it does not require the ascent of faith. As such, this level is subordinate to and should seek to be in conformity with the first two levels. Though this level does not require the ascent of faith, nevertheless, it requires a religious submission of the intellect and will as an extension of faith. This means that the faithful should always respect the Roman pontiff and the bishops and seek to adhere to the mind and intention they set forth, even if not a dogmatic fact. Since this category is not protected by the charism of infallibility, it is possible for anything that falls under it to be reformable. If we go back to our analogy of a human person, we can think of this level of the magisterium like a particular accidental structure of a human being. For instance, not all human beings are six feet tall, and thus this acquired height is neither explicitly in the definition of a man, nor implicitly. Even so, in this category of magisterial teaching, not necessarily related to the definitive or non-definitive charism of infallibility. This category is where the Pope and bishops in union with him have a little flexibility in their prudential decisions and engagement with the faith, and as such, the faithful also have a little flexibility when it comes to assent. With that being said, it must be noted that there is a general protection by the Holy Spirit, which will keep the church from perpetual error, and thus suspending ascent should be avoided at all costs. This category is really meant to be ordered towards the first two, so as to better shepherd the faithful into the deeper reception of the truths we hold near and dear. For this reason, the Supreme Pontiff and Universal Magisterium should always be conceptualized as making changes for the benefit of the Church as a whole, and thus we ought to move with, with the boat by submitting our intellect and will with the greatest fervency. Thus far we have discussed the three levels of magisterial teaching which descends to the faithful. Two of these three levels are dogmatic, and thus they descend to us from the Lord himself, who is the head of the church. The first of the two we have discussed is subdivided into two, the Extraordinary Papal Magisterium and Extraordinary Conciliar Magisterium. From the Pope directly, or from all bishops in union together with him, the pure milk of the word descends to us in definitive articles which truth himself has revealed to the church. These solemn judgments that are proposed to the faithful require the assent of faith. The second level we discuss is called the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium. Like the first level, this category also requires the assent of faith. Contained within this category are dogmas of the church that have not been solemnly defined but nevertheless are diffused into the praxis of the church. The bottom of the three categories is called Authentic Ordinary Magisterium. Though the Holy Spirit provides a general protection from perpetual error, nevertheless, if error does creep into the church, it will be from this category. As such, the church asks of us to submit with religious assent of intellect and will. Whatever falls under this category is non-definitive and thus reformable. Having summarized the three levels of magisterial teaching, let us now go on to answer some orthodox objections. 
It is commonly said by those of the Orthodox Church that the papacy does not solve the epistemic problem, but rather increases it exponentially. The Orthodox believe that they have justification in asserting this by appealing to the countless papal documents that not only clash with each other, but require further expositions to clarify. This, in and of itself, disproves papal infallibility. This objection sounds like a good one at the surface level, but given further consideration of Vatican I and the three levels of ascent, it is actually a non sequitur. As we have laid out above, there are three levels of magisterial teaching which descends to the faithful. The faithful are only required to assent by the theological virtue of faith in those truths which are the bedrock of the church and grounded in sacred scripture and sacred tradition as handed down by the apostles. These truths are made manifest to the faithful by the solemn judgment of the Roman pontiff, speaking ex cathedra, or when the conciliar magisterium acts in union together with him. So how do we know what we must follow as divinely revealed? It's simple, really. The intrinsic principle of faith by which we must assent individually follows the extrinsic principle of the magisterium, which has infallibly laid out the teaching either by solemn definition or by universal praxis, which is diachronic in nature. Given that it requires the ascent of faith, then the objects to be believed are identified as above reason. That is, apart from faith, the object would not be known with certitude. Thus, the very fact that it could not be known apart from divine revelation means that it's an article apprehended by the theological virtue of faith. These dogmas are manifestly evident and diffused to the faithful with either a loud echo or an undeniable impulse which is perennially and universally present. As such, the sheep hear it and know it with certitude, resting upon Christ himself and the instrument he uses to feed the faithful. Now an example of a dogma to which we as the faithful adhere to with the theological virtue of faith and not reason alone is the two natures of Christ. At no point could this or any dogma be a dogma if it can be known with certitude by reason apart from faith. Thus, the play on reason and faith secures the faithful insofar as they hold to the distinction as made manifested by the Church. Vatican I says the conflation of reason and faith is inadmissible. For this reason, the articles require faith, the articles requiring faith, are self-evident and no Catholic should be confused as to what is dogma and what is not. Which brings us to a concrete example commonly brought against the Church by the Orthodox. Namely, the undeniable shift in the death penalty. Before we can even ask if this object is malleable or not, we must first ask whether it's an object of faith or reason. If of reason, then it is reformable. If of faith, then it cannot change. History tells us that prior to the Ten Commandments being solidified by Moses, that many earlier civilizations had already practiced some of the laws. One of the laws known to many in virtue of human reason, and apart from divine revelation, is the intuition not to murder. It is also a universal part of societal justice to kill a person who is convicted as a murderer. But as we grow in understanding the dignity of the human person, it's appropriate to try and tend away from demanding the death penalty when adequate alternatives are available. Notice that I have not given my opinion on the situation, but merely am stating that this particular teaching has the nature of being reformable. For since this object does not require the gift of faith, then it neither belongs to the first category or the second category, and thus at no time should we expect an ex cathedra statement on the matter. But rather with religious submission of intellect and will, 
We are called to follow the nods and impulses of the church insofar as it doesn't tend away from the core dogmas. Remember that the third category is meant to move the faithful to a deepening of the faith so as to be more receptive for the grace of God. Whatever changes are implemented by the church ought to be informed by and tending towards the revealed supernatural truths by God. In short, whatever objections the Orthodox bring forward against papal infallibility needs to be at the level of a dogma. But if the Orthodox want to assert that all should be clear because of the papacy, then they are literally making a category error. For clarity is only promised by Christ in regards to the objects of faith to which the whole church is tending towards as a whole, which are solemnly defined or universally practiced. But whatever doesn't require the assent of faith is ipso facto reformable, and in no time should the church feel like they don't know what is necessary for salvation, since what is necessary is clearly manifested. There is more that we could consider about the distinction of assent, but I will save that for another video. Let's move on to consider one more objection of the Orthodox, namely the untimeliness of Vatican I's definition of papal infallibility. If this dogma is so crucial, then why did the Church survive without it for almost two millennia? The answer to this is very simple and can be considered from two aspects. First of all, the Church did not survive apart from this charism, but rather couched within the historical narrative and all the ecumenical councils was this implicit knowledge that God ordained Rome as the sole participant in the entirety of the Petrine Charism. This is why at Nicaea, Rome was not only mentioned, but was an exemplar unto the other churches in structuring their jurisdiction. Unlike the other Petrine sees, Rome was not given its prerogative from any ecumenical council, but rather all councils recognized that Rome had this authority in virtue of Christ himself. If anyone wants to hear more about Rome's authority in sacred scripture, then I direct the listener to the two videos I made which show how this city was foreordained by God to be the seat of the church. This was so attested to in sacred scripture and tradition that the fathers and the councils recognized it as a divinely revealed truth. For this reason, no ecumenical council grants to Rome supremacy, but rather all bishops pattern themselves after her as an exemplar and look to her as the one whom hell would not prevail against. The second aspect should also be considered when asking why papal infallibility was defined so late. Namely, did the church believe that epistemology needs to be clearly laid out prior to knowing the truths of the faith? Underlying the orthodox question is a modern assumption that epistemic certitude needs to be definitionally established prior to theology. But this couldn't be further from the natural order of theology as established by the church. Let me explain. Up until the Enlightenment, metaphysics always had priority over epistemology and from it an epistemic certitude naturally flowed out. For ontology gives rise to metaphysics, which informs epistemology. For nothing is known unless it is experienced first as being, and as being in this way, namely a rational way, epistemology is grounded. This order of knowledge, however, was flipped upside down such that knowledge must be grounded first prior to knowing. There is a lot more that could be said about this disordered way of doing things, but I will table that for another video where I will compare the orthodox presupposition position with the Catholic position on natural theology. My main point for bringing this up is to draw the listener to a consideration, namely the epistemic criteria by which the church defines truth infallibly was definitively revealed later than earlier because she does not presuppose epistemology before ontology and metaphysics. 
For even as a man does not define what reason is, whereby he knows truths he has known his whole life, until he is mature, so the church did not define the mechanism whereby she recognized divine truth until she was mature. But in either case, it's implicit that the infallible magisterium was there from the first moment of apprehending truth. One might say that Mother Church countered the Enlightenment epistemic question by shouting forth with the greatest of vigor her rock of certitude. The last orthodox objection against papal infallibility I want to consider is the incident of the monothelites and Pope Honorius. When it comes to the condemnation of Honorius at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, it should be noted that he did not issue, nor intend to issue, anything authoritative. He merely conceded with Patriarch Sergius position so as to not weigh in formally on the matter. In fact, if one reads his position carefully, it seems that he, like Maximus the Confessor, wasn't rejecting two wills, but rather affirming that Christ's will was not gnomic, and as such, it was completely in sync with the divine so as to be considered one will. This one will, one activity, originates from Dionysius the Arpagite, who states that the hypostatic union resulted in one new theandric energy. Now, it should be noted that no time did Dionysius clarify his position on this, and yet the church didn't declare him to be a heretic. It was actually Maximus the Confessor who vindicated St. Dionysius, and also attempted to do the same with Pope Honorius as well. However, to whom much is given, much is required. For this reason, Pope Honorius failed to exercise good prudence and ought to have recognized the seriousness of what was being posited by Sergius. But that Pope Honorius recognizes two wills is clearly demonstrated by his verbiage. It's the sin which is characterized by the manifestly distinct gnomic will which Christ did not have. In this, Maximus the Confessor and Pope Honorius agreed. Nevertheless, the Pope was condemned at the Sixth Ecumenical Council after his death for confirming, or rather failing to restrain, Sergius's impious doctrine. So, Honorius was not called a heretic because he issued an impious doctrine formally, which would destroy papal infallibility, but rather for not restraining an impious doctrine with greater clarity. That is, Pope Honorius failed to compose and divide rightly with his God-given prudence so as to harmonize philosophy with theology in a coherent way, and as such, lending to Serge's error. From all the writings around the incident, we as the faithful are assured that Pope Honorius was only a heretic in fact and not in tension, in matter and not in form and thus this incident should in no way undermine the indefectibility of the Roman See, such as to render papal infallibility void. Now, there are many more orthodox objections we could consider, but I think that they are better analyzed under natural theology, and as such we will not be discussing them in this video. Let this suffice for answering objections against papal infallibility. Now let's turn our attention to an illustration which might help elucidate the three levels of magisterial teaching for the listener to grasp. In sacred scripture, the paradigmatic image used to describe the church is a unified body, but not just any body, but a mystical body which is the extension of Christ himself. This body, just like our natural body, is multifaceted and composed of powers which are infallible and extended members which only participate in infallibility by moving in conjunction with the infallible power. The highest power in the human person which has an infallible aspect is the power called the intellect. This power is sometimes called 
a light and can simply be thought of as that which has truth as its object and apprehends it for the government of the body. If the listener wants to know more about this power, then I recommend my title, my video titled, What is Truth? Now, since truth is the homogenous object of this power, then the intellect has to apprehend something infallibly. Every single person in virtue of being a rational animal has been gifted with this power by God so as to engage with cre created truth and order their lower faculties according to what's good and shy away from what's evil. The application of this light in the real world is what we call practical reasoning. Now, if God so ordains that every human person has a light by which to infallibly apprehend created truth and order their life, how much more will God give the church, whose very object is truth itself, an infallible power which apprehends with the greatest precision what God wants to make known to his members so as to govern them towards himself. There's a lot more that could be said about the agent intellect by which we apprehend truth, but what I have said already is enough to paint a starting picture for the listener to run with. So then, the Pope would be the agent intellect whose very charism of infallibility in virtue of Peter's gift in Matthew 16, is to shine a bright light upon the articles of faith and illuminate them so that the entire body walks in truth and towards truth. Now, since the intellect is not bound to an organ of the body, it has the ability to penetrate the entire person. This is a good way of understanding universal jurisdiction and why the Pope is not bound to any circumscribed area or rather pierces them all as a servant to all. Now let's consider the extended bishops who are in union with the Pope. These bishops also participate in the charism of infallibility when they are gathered together in union with him so as to make something known to the faithful which was divinely revealed. Unlike the Pope who has universal jurisdiction, the bishops all have limited jurisdiction in a particular circumscribed area. For this reason, the many bishops can be conceived of in the body as the brain which moves all the members. Unlike the intellect, the brain is not a power of the immaterial soul, but a necessary part of the body which governs all the limbs and regulates the body. Now when the brain works in conjunction with the power of the intellect, it receives truth and disseminates it so as to move the body according to right reason. Which brings us to the lay faithful who receive the truth from the highest power, namely the Holy Father, and the brain which work in conjunction with him, namely the universal magisterium. This movement with the infallible power of the intellect informed by the brain is called the sense of the faithful. This sense, or impulse, is granted towards the faithful by the gift of faith. With this gift, the lay faithful, who are the different limbs of the body, move with the governing authorities established by Christ. But unlike the magisterium, the lay faithful is called to go out into the world and spread energetically the truth which redounds to her from the hierarchy. Each member after Mass is commissioned to go out and share the good news, even as it's the lens of the body which engages with another outside of themselves. This distinction between the lower level of the church engaging with the secular world and the higher level being more secluded is actually seen in the book of Acts. Peter, with the twelve, says it's not right for them to leave the word and serve tables. The hierarchy of the bishops and the pope have the word specifically as their object whereby they deliver to the body the food of truth, while the lay faithful, being that they don't have the commission to feed the faithful, are called to participate with the hierarchy by spreading truth into the secular domain. This is why a priest and bishop do not work in a secular domain, 
what the lay faithful do. Essentially, we go out into the dark of the world, guided by the sense of the faithful, and engage it head on. But this engagement should always be informed by and moved by the hierarchy established by Christ to give light to the body so as to reach out with this light into darkness. There's a lot more that could be said about the census fidelium, but I'll save that for a video which focuses, focuses on that very topic alone. Now, before I explain how error creeps into the church, I want to first clarify something. The listener at this point might be asking themselves, where is the Holy Spirit in all of this? The short answer is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is supplying all the gifts that the faithful have, from the Pope at the top to the lowest level member at the foot. The gift of faith and charity binds all the faithful together, and the Holy Spirit himself is moving all the members according to his will and purpose, so as to guide the whole body into all truth. Truth himself is the final object of the church, who is none other than our glorified Lord, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. In short, the hierarchy is not at the expense of the Holy Spirit, but rather is the Holy Spirit active so as to guide the entire church unto Christ himself. For since God moves all things orderly and sweetly, and disorder is in no way proceeding from him, then the church above all bears the stamp of God's wisdom made manifested. Now, when it comes to error creeping into the church, these are in no way to be attributed to the doctrine God reveals himself, but rather they slip in when men, even bishops, acting in their local domain of reason, misdirect those beneath them in a way incongruent with the dogmas. These errors can come about from wrongly composing and dividing by philosophy and thus clouding the truth. We must remember that when it comes to third level of magisterial teaching, there is a possibility for error to slip in, though not perpetually, so as to overcome the church. It should be noted that these errors come from the outside and slither in, and not from the inside out. For inside at the heart of the church is Christ himself, who is present in the Holy Eucharist and is the source and summit of the Catholic life. In him there is no darkness, but the pure divine light, and thus darkness can only come from without. For example, when the secular world moves in a way which is in opposition from the church, then there is a tendency due to our engagement with the world to receive transfer from them. Kind of like when a car rubs another car and leaves something of its own imprint upon it. Minds of the world collide with the reasoning of the faithful and teachings that are incongruent or at least imprudent attempt to press itself against the rock of Christ. These transfers are political, social, and at times a reek of rationalism divorced from dogmatic light of faith. In the simplest of terms, the church is between God and the world, and as such she clings to God by the gift of faith and the light which descends from above, but yet she also is impressed by the world who is always attempting to undermine Catholic virtue and pull them away from the light. Thus, when the bishops are exercising their lowest level of authority, it is sometimes possible that outside influence informs their prudential decisions. In this video, we have thoroughly laid out a fundamental understanding of the three magisterial levels of teaching and the ascent to which we must owe. Sometimes the church seems dark and gloomy, and jumping ship seems most congruent. But if we imagine Christ on the cross, then we have the perfect exemplar whom to pattern our life after in dark times. Like our Lord, the church is between heaven and earth, and at all times those beneath her are not only mocking her, but also attempting to bring her down. But like Peter crucified upside down, 
God is guiding her feet unto him, since he promised the gates of hell will not prevail against her. So let us not lose hope nor despair in the darkness, which not only surrounds the church, but even creeps inside so as to test her fidelity. Let us submit with religious submission of will and intellect, even when it seems the Babylonians have crept into the church, knowing that the pure dogmas is that which the devil cannot touch and calls us into him who is, in essence, light itself. Nature tells us that the gnats and mosquitoes will undoubtedly try to come where light is present, but the very light which saves the faithful will turn out to be the one that zaps the wicked when the Lord is manifested in flaming fire. Whoever clings to the Lord will not be put to shame. To him alone belongs praise and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you all for watching this episode of Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship. Stay strong in the Catholic faith, and until next time, God bless.